Hello, and thank you for tuning in to First Baptist Church of Conway. I'm Rocky Taylor, one of the pastors here, and it is our prayer that this video will be a resource to help you grow in faith in Jesus and to know His love for you. While we are glad to provide this sermon video, let me remind you that it's not a substitute for being a part of the weekly fellowship of believers with whom you can worship and share life. I hope to see you here next Sunday at 10 a.m. May God bless you as you remain faithful to Him. Well, good morning. I'm glad to be here with you as we continue our sermon series called The Road to Easter. Uh, we have a lot of ground to cover in the life of Jesus this morning. Over the fast, uh, excuse me, fast, over the past a uh, few weeks, we've been looking at the last week of the life of Jesus, also referred to as Holy Week. And today we are picking up where we left off last week. Jesus has just been arrested and now he's headed to trial. And today we're going to read a lot of Bible. Is that okay? We're going to do it anyways, okay? Just letting you know, we're doing it anyways. We have a lot of narratives to cover because in about seven to eight hours, a whiplash of events happened. Jesus was arrested like late Thursday night or early, early Friday morning and was put on the cross about nine o'clock in the morning. And it's super hard to figure out exactly what went on and how it all transpired. But because I am super smart, I've put all this together for you. Or I just read a book that helped me walk through it. Which one do you think? It's the book part. Do you know that you can do everything I do if you just read the right books? That's all it is. You just read what other people have done for you. And so these stories that we're going to look at today, the reason why we're going to read them is because they're filled with tragedy. I mean, Jesus, one of Jesus' closest friends denies him. The religious leaders who were supposed to have the greatest integrity and teach people about God put this, uh, falsely accuse him. And then the Rome, I mean, the government authorities convict a man they know is innocent. And I mean, many of us are familiar, at least we've probably heard about this idea of Peter denying Jesus three times. But the religious leaders also accuse, uh, falsely accuse Jesus three times. And Rome could set Jesus free three times. So in the course of these events, we have nine times, and what we're going to read, nine times where, where people fail to do the right thing for Jesus Christ. And so here's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to look at Peter's denials. We're going to look at what the religious authorities do and then the Roman authorities do. We're going to learn about why they specifically denied or rejected Jesus and these stories are all about how evil has finally done its worst. All of the stories and all the buildup that's been happening in the Gospels, now all of it just comes together and the world rejects Jesus. I mean, corporately, the world, the Gentiles, the Jews, his followers, the world just rejects who Jesus is. Remember two weeks ago, we learned about Jesus riding in on a donkey. We call it the triumphal entry. Jesus clears up any ambiguity about who people may think he is or maybe who he thought he was. He clears that all up by coming in as the king. Last week, we saw him in the Garden of Gethsemane, and the authorities came up. They teamed up both Rome and the Jews to arrest Jesus. We saw Peter chop a guy's ear off. Then he ran to avoid being arrested. And now we're going to jump into his story and look at what happens to him next. Now remember, Jesus has been arrested. Jesus is inside. We're going to take a minute to look at what Peter does next. This is his denials. Matthew 26 says this. It says, Meanwhile, Peter was sitting outside the courtyard, and a servant girl came over and said to him, You were one of those with Jesus, the Galilean. But Peter denied in front of everyone. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. Later, out by the gate, another servant girl noticed him and said to those standing around him, this man was with Jesus of, Nazareth, uh, Jesus of Nazareth. Again, Peter denied it, this time with an oath. I do not even know the man, he said. And a little later, some of the other bystanders came over to Peter and said, you must be one of them. We can tell by your Galilean accent. Peter swore, 
a curse on me if I'm lying. I do not know the man. And immediately the rooster crowed. Suddenly Jesus' words flashed through Peter's mind. Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times that you will not even know me. And he went away weeping bitterly. You see, Peter, Jesus has been arrested, right? Jesus is inside. Peter's outside waiting to see what happens to Jesus. And he gets caught up in this moment of weakness and fear. I mean, he's close enough to to kind of be around what's happening, but not bold enough to be in the center of what's going on. He's not bold enough to declare his allegiance to Jesus Christ. And it's one thing, and you know this, have you ever spoke before you thought? Okay, so everybody's done that. It's not just a me thing, right? So this isn't just Peter speaking before he's thinking. He denies him three times. And that's what wrecks him. That's why he starts crying. He has failed Jesus. And I think what makes it even worse is Jesus knew it. I mean, Jesus said, you're going to do it. He's like, no way, not me. And then he does it. And so he's just sitting there in his self-reliance. He thought, and maybe you've been here before, you thought you could handle it. And then you found out you couldn't. You couldn't handle it. And so what's going on with Peter? It's pretty simple. Peter's denial is because he's afraid of where following Jesus would take him. It'll be up there in a second. But Peter's denial is he's afraid of where following Jesus would take him. Although Jesus told him, you must be ready to take up your own cross and follow him. In the moment, in the moment of this self-reliance, and I got this, Peter failed. He thought he could handle whatever came his way. Self-reliance at its best. This happened outside, but now Jesus was being questioned inside, and we're going to look at Jesus' trials before the religious authorities. First up is Jesus before Hanias, the former high priest. John 18, 19 through 20. It says, inside, the high priest began asking Jesus about his followers and what he had been teaching them. Jesus replied, everyone knows what I teach. I have preached regularly in the synagogues and in the temple where the people gathered. I have not spoken in secret. Translation, Jesus has spoken in public. They already know what he's been teaching, but they have come at night when no one's around privately to arrest them. And now they're privately putting them on trial. Jesus is saying, I've done everything publicly, folks. But look what you're doing. You're secretly doing these things. Why are you asking me this question? Ask those who heard me. They know what I said. Then one of the temple guards standing nearby slapped Jesus across the face. Is that the way to answer the high priest, he demanded? Jesus replied, if I said anything wrong, you must prove it. But if I'm speaking the truth, why are you beating me? Then Ananias bound Jesus and sent him to Caiaphas, the high priest. So here Jesus is saying, if if I've done something wrong, if I'm lying, you got to do what? Prove it. He's saying, this fake trial, uh uh-uh. Take me to a real one. And so they now take him before Caiaphas, the high priest. Let's see what happens here. Matthew 26, verse 57. says, then the people who had arrested Jesus led him to the home of Caiaphas, the high priest where the teachers of religious law and the elders had gathered. Inside, the leading priests and the entire high council were trying to find witnesses who would lie about Jesus so they could put him to death. But even though they found many who agreed to give false witness, they could not use anyone's testimony. Finally, two men came forward who declared, This man said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it, in three days. Now they're pointing back to a teaching Jesus did make publicly. He was speaking about his, his body, but they took it as the temple because of how he phrased it and what he said. I mean, so they're pointing back to this thing of Jesus talking about destroying God's temple. Verse 62. Then the high priest stood up and said to Jesus, well, aren't you going to answer these charges? What do you have to say for yourself? But Jesus remained silent. Then the high priest said to him, I demand in the name of the living God. That's getting serious now, isn't it? 
Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. Jesus replied, you said it. You want to know the truth? Here it is. I'm, I'm, I'm him. And in the future, you will see the Son of Man seated in the place of power at God's right hand, coming on the clouds of heaven. He's pointing back to a prophecy in Daniel. That thing you've been reading about, that thing you're waiting on, I'm going to be the guy to do it. Then the high priest tore his clothing to show his horror and said, blasphemy. Why do we need another witness? You have all heard this. Blasphemy. What is your verdict? Guilty, they shouted. He deserves to die. See, blasphemy is speaking profanely about God. Jesus is claiming to have a special, a special relationship with God. He's claiming to be the son of God. He's saying, I'm going to be the one to come back like you guys have been looking for, that you're waiting on like that's going to be me. And although he's telling the truth, they don't like his truth. They don't like the truth. They want it to fit in with the way they understand things, with the way they want to do things. They're calling him a liar. Because if God was going to do something, I mean, surely the religious people would accept it, right? I mean, if God was going to move, it's going to move the way I think it should happen. Does, isn't that how life works? Have you all found that to be true? Right? It doesn't work that way, does it? But they're saying, well, no, no, no. We, are the, we are the pastors. We are the priests. We are the ones who know. If God was moving, we'd approve. Pretty sure it's supposed to be the other way around, isn't it? If God moves, we react, not God moving on our time schedule. Yeah, there you go. So now they need to, um, well, here's what happens. Verse 6, 7, it says, Then they begin to spit in Jesus' face and beat him with their fist. It's not a very good trial, is it? All right. And some slapped him, jeering, Prophesy to us, you Messiah. Who hit you that time? And so now they have the evidence they believe to take him before the Sanhedrin. That's the 70 rulers and 71 to include the high priest. So they're calling together the, the high council. And we don't know if all of them were there or not, but they called together the big group. So Matthew 27. So this is Jesus for Sanhedrin, third time now. It says, very early in the morning, the leading priests and the elders of the, and the, elders of the people met again to lay plans for put Jesus to death. They, be, they bound him and led him away and took him to Pilate, the Roman governor. So the Sanhedrin, the, the ruling council came together. We don't really know what's said there, but they pronounced judgment. They were unable to put Jesus to death. It was above their law and above their jurisdiction, like what they could do. So they had to take him to Rome, and that's where the story moves. Here's how they now persuade Rome to kill Jesus. So what's going on here? We have Jesus being brought before three different groups of the Jewish elite, the Jewish religious people, and they all declare him guilty and looking for reasons to get rid of him. And they need testimonies from other peoples to affirm what they believe is true. And while if we take this story in isolation from the rest of the Gospels, it's super hard to figure out what's going on. I mean, because what Jesus said doesn't seem like that big of a deal, especially if it's true. But remember, this has been bubbling up. This, is, this conflict with Jesus and the Roman authorities have been happening for quite some time now. Remember, Israel, the nation of Israel, was supposed to be the light into the world. They were supposed to be God's representatives to the world to show them what it looks like for God to be in charge. But instead, it became a holy huddle focused on their own selfish desires. And these people, this religious people, had it all figured out. They knew exactly what to do in any and all situations in life. They clearly knew, because of their rules and regulations, who was in and who was out. Who God loved and who God didn't. They knew that their self-righteousness would get them favor with God. Well, Jesus comes on the scene and exposes them. He calls them hypocrites. He broke their traditions and they got furious with them about it. He hung out with people they deemed unredeemable. They said, those guys aren't good enough. You can't do anything with them. And Jesus would go to parties with them. He claimed to have greater authority than they did. Basically, just imagine this. Jesus showing up, 
and saying, everything you've done in your religious life is wrong and you're going to hell. How would that feel? Yeah, you'd be like, I, I don't appreciate that. Yeah, either did they. They didn't like it at all. This is his message. Everything you're doing, wrong, and you're going to hell. They didn't take too kindly to that. But you see, their worship wasn't bringing them closer to God. Like, how do you know it wasn't bringing them closer to God? I mean, surely it did. Because he was standing in front of them. Their worship was pulling them away to where they missed him. Isn't that amazing? The God they claim to worship is standing in their midst and they miss him. They reject him and kill him. You see, their religion brought them to a place of self-righteousness, thinking they're better than others, thinking they know better than others, causing them to reject people, causing them to have self-promotion and miss God. So the religious reject Jesus because of the change he brought to their self-righteous religious life. Jesus said, we need to change the way you're doing this. They're like, we don't want to change it. He's like, yeah, but I'm God and I'm standing in your midst and you're missing me. So clearly your worship isn't really worship. And if their worship wasn't about him or bringing him closer to him, who is their worship actually about? Could, could you imagine a place where people would start worshiping themselves? To where everything they did revolved around them and what they liked and their desires? We're like, we can never imagine something like that. Right, like they missed... They weren't worshiping him because he was there. So they reject him for this. And so they take Jesus to the Roman authorities because they say, we got to kill this guy. He's messing everything up. Luke 23, we're going on another journey now. Luke 23, one through two. says, then the entire council took Jesus to Pilate, the Roman governor. They begin to state their case. This man has been leading groups of people astray by telling them not to pay their taxes to the Roman government and by claiming he is the Messiah, a king. None of this was brought up at the trial. Did you notice that? They found Jesus guilty for religious reasons, but taking religious reasons to court, even back then, wouldn't have worked out. So they had to make something up. They say he's trying to be this rebel. He's trying to take away Rome's money. He's trying to be a king. He's leading this this movement, this rebellion against Rome, which of course isn't true. And so Pilate asked, Pilate asked him, so are you the king of the Jews? Jesus replied, you have said it. Now, if you want to do reading on your own, we know more than this was said in this conversation. You can go read John 18, John chapter 18. This is where Jesus tells Pilate that his kingdom is not of this world, that he's been born into this world to testify the truth. And that's when Pilate says his famous statement, what is truth? You remember that? That's John 18. You can go back and read that. But this is that event. And Pilate can see through what's happening. Look at what he says next. It says, Pilate turned to the leading priest and to the crowd and said, I find nothing wrong with this man. Then they became insistent, but he's causing riots by his teaching. Wherever he goes, all over Judea, from Galilee to Jerusalem. Now, Pilate was charged as the governor for Rome to keep the peace. And they know that. And so if Jesus was causing riots, Pilate had to put an end of it for the government. But here's the deal. If Jesus was calling riot, riots and he was causing this kind of workup, Pilate would have already known about it. He would have already, Jesus wasn't on his radar, right? So this wasn't actually happening. But they gave him an out when they mentioned he's from Galilee. Look at this, verse 6. Oh, he's a Galilean? The great, I don't have to deal with this now. Pilate asked, when they said that he, when they said he was, Pilate sent him to Herod Antip- Antipas because he was Galilean under Herod's jurisdiction. And Herod happened to be in Jerusalem at that time. So learning that he was from Galilee, which is outside his jurisdiction, he's like, you know what, I don't need to deal with this. Let King Herod deal with this. King Herod was the same one who killed John the Baptist. And who Rome installed as this puppet king. So he says, here, just send him over there. So number two, verse eight, the second second situation in front of Rome. Herod was delighted at the opportunity to see Jesus. 
because he had heard about him and been hoping uh, for a long time to see him perform a miracle. And he asked Jesus a question after question, but Jesus refused to give an answer. We can't stay here really long, but Herod wanted to perform. And if all you want is Jesus to perform for you, don't be surprised if you get what? No answer. Yeah, he's not in the business of, of just performing for us. That's not who he is. So he got no answer. And so verse 10 says, Meanwhile, here the priests are again, Meanwhile, the leading priests and the teachers of the religious law stood there shouting their accusations. Then Herod and his soldiers began mocking and ridiculing Jesus. Finally, they put a royal robe on him and sent him back to Pilate. Herod and Pilate, who had been enemies before, became friends that day. So with Jesus refusing to answer because he just wants to see some magic tricks, they start mocking him, trying to get this reaction out of him, and Jesus just sat there in silence. So they sent them back to Pilate, number th the third time in front of Roman authorities. Pilate twice, but third situation. Then Pilate called together leading priests and the other, other religious leaders along with the people and announced his verdict. You've brought this man to me accusing him of leading a revolt. I have exam examined him thoroughly. And on this point, and in your presence, and in your presence, and find him innocent. Herod came to the same conclusion and sent him back to us. Nothing this man has done has cause for the death penalty. Six times he's been in front of people. And never once has he actually been found guilty of a crime. Because if he is the Messiah, he's telling the truth, right? He has it six times now. Verse 12. Then Pilate tried to release him. But the Jewish leader shouted, if you release this man, here's the rub. They got him. You are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who declares himself a king is a rebel against Caesar. So the crowds are so involved. Mob mentality is happening. Pilate could have squashed this from the beginning, just chose to say, hey, this guy's not doing anything wrong, but he kept playing with it. He sent it to Herod, then he came back, and now he's got the situation. It's not just the leaders, now it's the crowd. And now they're threatening to tell his bosses if he doesn't do something about it. Remember, it was his job to keep the peace. But now Pilate has to choose. Do I pick Jesus or do I pick Caesar? Do I claim my allegiance to the government in which I work and their purposes and what the government wants to do? Or do I choose this lowly Jewish king, they say? When they said this, Pilate brought Jesus out to them again. This Pilate, excuse me, then Pilate turned Jesus over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus away. You see, Pilate condemned Jesus to serve the government. He wanted to keep peace even if an innocent man had to die for it. So he hands over Jesus to be crucified. And we'll pick up there on Friday. You see, it's clear that the gospel writers are communicating to us how everyone failed. The leadership, the crowds, the followers, the politicians, everyone there denied and rejected Jesus. Everyone turned their back on him. And we see why, right? Peter was afraid where following Jesus would take him. The religious, well, they rejected the change Jesus wanted to bring to the religious life. Pilate condemned Jesus because he was more worried about what the government thought than what Jesus thought. And the gospel writers are communicating, right? Like everybody failed. All of these people, these are their reasons why they rejected and denied Jesus. And of course, this is the time where I then want to look at their stories, right? And we want to investigate what they dealt with so we can look at our lives and see if, if these struggles apply to our lives. But they don't. And that's what rocked us this week. These struggles don't apply to us. Because listen, we can never be in Peter's shoes. As far as I can tell, his own efforts took him pretty far in following Jesus. 
He left his family. He left his company. I mean, he left everything he knew and walked around with Jesus for three years. As far as I can tell, we can never be in the religious leader situation. We can't know what it's like to be raised a Jew in a Jewish household, pass down these traditions that seem like life or death, and if you don't do it, you're going to miss out on what God is doing. And then all of a sudden, this guy comes and claims to be a Messiah, and you, you don't want to break with your dad or your grandpa told you. I mean, like in pig Jesus, like that doesn't make any sense. I mean, we can never be in a place where Pilate was. We can never be in the place to pick allegiance to Jesus or our nation. I mean, in, in his eyes, this is just some lowly Jewish guy. Rome has crushed who? Everyone. So why wouldn't you pick Rome? I mean, what they went through, we could never go through. Here's why. Folks, we live on the other side of the resurrection. We actually know how the story goes. We know that Peter was restored and became a leading figure in the movement that changed the world. We know that Rome crushed the Jewish people in their traditions. They literally crushed the temple and burnt it down. Everything they clung to, as Jesus prophesied, we looked at two weeks ago, was completely and utterly destroyed. We know that that Roman Empire would all become Christian a couple hundred years later. And it would change the Roman Empire. But you see, that story hadn't happened yet. So, of course, Peter's going to try on his own efforts to follow Jesus. He hasn't been redeemed. He hasn't been set free. He is not living with the power of the Holy Spirit yet. He's still trying to figure out what this looks like. Of course, the religious leaders would choose what's comfortable, their own traditions, their own powers to make their life better. I mean, why wouldn't they? They're dead in their sin. They loved themselves more than God. They didn't know he was moving. And of course, Pilate would acclaim allegiance to Rome. There wasn't a better option out there. Why take up for a, lonely, a lowly Jewish man rather than an entire nation? These are just people who were scared, don't like change, cling to what they know, trying to make sense of their life. And why wouldn't they? They're dead in their sin. And in fact, God knew that they would reject him. You see, all of these stories show us and remind us that those things don't work. That if someone could have gotten it right on their own efforts, it would have probably been Peter. If a religion and traditions earned favor with, with um, God and earned your salvation, the Jews probably would have been the ones to get that right. And if an empire had all the answers to solve the world's problems, it probably would have been Rome. But none of those things will actually bring you closer to God. In fact, what we learn is they will cause you to reject God. That's exactly what we see happen here. Because the big event hadn't happened yet, folks. The big thing that changed the world, the most important aspect of our faith, hadn't happened yet. Paul says it like this in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, and if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you're still guilty of your sins. In that case, all who've died believing in Christ are lost. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, that's important. That's what they were thinking about. We are to be pitied more than anyone in the world. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. And he is the first of the great harvest of all who have died. You see, the resurrection changed everything. The resurrection's where our hope lies. What Jesus has done, died and risen to give this eternal life, to, to understand that has changed the world. You see, the question isn't, why did they deny Jesus? The question is, why are you still rejecting Jesus for these same reasons after the resurrection? Why are we pushing Jesus to the side after the resurrection? You see, you don't need to be afraid of where your faith will take you. You don't need to be afraid of where following Jesus is going to lead. If you were a follower of Jesus 
there is no reason for you to identify with Peter before the resurrection. You should identify with Peter after the resurrection. This bold witness for Jesus Christ. You see, Peter stopped relying on himself and his own power. He prioritized his relationship with Jesus Christ and went all in for the mission of Jesus, dedicating his life to it. And we don't have to guess what Jesus wants from us. He wants to pull us closer to himself. He wants to empower us to live for the purpose he created. And none of that other stuff you chase will ever bring you the satisfaction that he'll bring. Because if someone can predict their own, their own death and resurrection and actually pull it off, or you just believe everything else they say. You just trust them. You see, our faith is rooted in a God who loves you, who is for you, who wants you to join in the mission of the world that he is doing. He says, come on, join me. Let's do this. Let's go. The message is, from the gospel, the message that Christianity believes is, you can't do enough on your own power to get it right. And you don't have to be, because he did it, so you don't have to. So we rest in his strength and his power, and we depend upon him. You see, Peter started to believe or understood after the resurrection. He said, Jesus he really has the power over this life and the next. Like, I don't have to put my hope here. It doesn't matter what happens to me because Jesus really did rise from that grave. Which means you don't need to cling to traditions and comfort because folks, those things will not save you. If you are a follower of Jesus, there is no reason why you should identify with the religious people before the resurrection, stuck in self-righteousness and tradition. Tradition won't save you. That's, that's not what the, the, it's not the gospel. You should identify with the church in the book of Acts, where the gospel continually changed them. It blew their culture up. I mean, they had to deal with like women now being a part of the church. They had to deal with people who didn't look like them or talk like them, start becoming a part of the church. I mean, the gospel changed all of that stuff. Where it's not just the religious, elite, holy huddle over here. Now it's all people come together. And the early church actually dealt with this issues of traditions. We've talked about this before. Do you remember the gospel was being taken out into the entire world? And people said, well, we, we like, you know, we're Jewish people and, and Jesus is Jewish. So that means in order to be saved, you have to be circumcised. You remember that? Y'all got to read your Bible. This is a true story. The altar call would have been, come give your life to Jesus and get circumcised today and you'll be saved. That's what they were, that, that's what they were dealing with. Like, do we bring these traditions to this? And do you remember what the early people said? The council came together and said, no. James stood up, the brother of Jesus stood up and said, and it's my judgment that we should not make, should not, should not, should not, we need to circle that, we need to memorize that, should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. We don't need to do this to people. The gospel's important. And so what I hope and pray for, I hope that one day my kids are sitting in church with me. I hope that one day my grandkids are sitting in church with me one day. I hope that we all get to worship together and I pray and I hope that I'm not focused on passing down tradition, not a tradition for them to keep, but I pray I'm passing down a deep love for Jesus Christ that they embrace for themselves. And if you embrace something yourself, if you really own it, then of course, of course, I hope they love Jesus so much that they use their talents and their gifts that God has given them to express their love for God in a way that makes sense to them. Don't you? And I hope that means rap music will be in church one day. <laughs> I'm just letting you know that's where I'm going with this. I'm hoping. But when we think about the next generation, what we want to pass down is a deep love for Jesus Christ. Folks, that's what matters. That's what saves us. 
Jesus does. And the gospel, and it's always been this way, the gospel is very uncomfortable. Because it's not about the rules or traditions you keep, but about the relationship you seek. The gospel isn't something you can contain. The gospel is a message that Jesus has unleashed in this world. We don't need to contain it. We don't need to control it. We need to literally be transformed by it. That's what the gospel is. Which means number three, and I don't know how else to say this, so I'm just going to say it. I love you guys, okay? Which means you don't need to lose your mind over politics. If you're a follower of Jesus, there is no reason why you should identify with Pilate thinking the government is going to save the world and have all the answers. Like, hasn't COVID and Putin showed us that's not going to happen? Like, have you, like, and I mean this with all, like, read history, folks. Governments come and go. And as Jesus followers, our hope is not in the government. Our hope is in Jesus Christ and his resurrection. Because remember, and this is very important, if Jesus wanted to start an empire, he would have. But he didn't. He started the church. That's why what we do actually matters. That's why we want you involved in this thing. Folks, he started the church. This is what he died for. We are his hope. What we do matters. We are to be the light unto the world. We are to be doing good work, sharing the gospel, growing in our faith. Like, this is it. We are it. That's why it's important. The church is the hope of the world, not the government. Not a political leader. Jesus. There's no greater organization you can serve than the local church, folks. We, as the people of, of Jesus, we actually believe we have the answer to the world's brokenness. Like, we have that. We're ambassadors of that. And so I ask you from the bottom of my heart, please do not ruin your testimony over politics. And please stop pretending a politician is going to represent Jesus well. I mean, please, vote, do your thing, but please stop thinking they're the next Jesus. They're not. Because listen, if Jesus was killed by the people for being Jesus, why would we think Jesus or any of his great representatives would be elected? Was Jesus elected? He was killed. Folks, Jesus is rough. Read the Gospels. His speeches cause people to what? Walk away. Not run to them. But what changed everything? If you can predict your own death and resurrection and actually pull it off, people tend to lean in and listen, don't they? But that's what he did. The resurrection changed everything. You see, we can't be in those other people's shoes because we know how the story ends. It changed literally the world, and it can change your world. Jesus faced rejection, betrayal, condemned as an innocent man because we were guilty. And we can never forget who put Jesus on the cross. It wasn't the Jews. It wasn't Rome. It wasn't Peter. And it wasn't you and it wasn't me. Romans 3, 25 says, for God. When you ever see something like that in the Bible, you better pay attention. For God presented Jesus as a sacrifice for our sins. Folks, this was his plan. This was his doing. For people are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. Jesus gave up his life. God, the Father, sent him. Folks, this was his idea. This is how the story was going to go no matter what. 
And the reason we don't have to identify with the disbelief and rejection is because of the resurrection, because of now the power we can have through his spirit. Romans 5, 8 says, but God, for God and now but God, showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for our sins while we were still sinners. We're going to talk more about that on Friday. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning remembering that you, that you chose to save us from our sin. That you showed us how much you love us by presenting Jesus as a sacrifice for our sin. Father, we thank you for saving us and redeeming us through the blood of Jesus Christ. Father, we confess that we too have denied or rejected you in our lives. Father, we have feelings and wants and desires that try to overtake everything. Forgive us for that. And Father, help us live as people of the resurrection, not putting our hope in this world, but putting our hope in Jesus and what you're going to bring us to in the next. Father, I ask that you transform us through your power, the power of your Holy Spirit. I pray that each one of us live on mission for you, knowing we can trust you, knowing you have done everything we need to be saved and we don't have to earn it. And we get to be a part of a church, a body of confessing Christians who want to be there for us, to work with us, to love us, to help us grow. And in return, we do the same. Father, we love you. We know, and we've seen 2,000 years later, how the resurrection really did change the world. But Father, help us live in light of that. Help us be the people of the resurrection. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.